Great, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the dinner last night. Um, welcome to the uh, first policy session of the third day of the conference. Uh, I would like to welcome the following speakers for this session who are now on the stage. Major General Professor Geoffrey Rosenfeld, Commodore Duncan Wallace and Lieutenant General Peter Leahy. Australia has a long history of involvement in overseas conflict zones. Members of our armed forces put themselves in harm's way on a daily basis, facing risks to both their physical and mental health. Since 1999, over 45,000 Australians have been op seen operational service overseas. During 2012-13, the Australian Defence Force was involved in 15 overseas operations, including uh, in regions and countries such as the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan, as well as those closer to home, such as uh, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, Samoa and Fiji. The medical profession has shown an enormous commitment to the care of ADF personnel and veterans, with many doctors serving in the ADF or being part of the framework of health services put in place by the ADF and the Department of Veterans Affairs to look after the wounded. It's a commitment that we should be proud of. This session will examine how the nature of conflict has changed and what impact this has had on the health and well-being of people serving in conflict zones. We will also examine the challenges faced in caring for these people when they return home, often with multiple comorbidities and complex care needs. At the end of the session, delegates will be asked to consider a draft motion recommending that AMA Federal Council develop further policy on how we can better care for those who have served and been wounded. Each speaker will talk uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, um, following which we'll have a Q&A session. Um, as with earlier sessions, the uh, questions will need to be submitted online. The uh, address is uh, natcom.ama.com.au. So our first speaker is uh, General Professor Geoffrey Rosenfeld, AMOBE. He is the Director of Neurosurgery at the Alfred Hospital and Professor and Head, Division of Clinical Sciences at the Department of Surgery, Central Clinical School, Monash University. He is the, the uh, immediate past Surgeon General of the ADF Reserves from 2009 uh, to 2011 and has served in seven ADF operations, including Rwanda, East Timor, Bougainville, Solomon Islands and Iraq. He was awarded the United States Air Force Commendation Medal and the Michael E. DeBakey International, International Military Surgeons Award for Excellence in Military Surgery in 2009. Please join me in welcoming Major General Rosenfeld to the lectern. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brian, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to talk to you about how we care for our soldiers in Australia. Through, through the Australian Defence Force. This is the problem in Iraq and Afghanistan, the major problem, and that is the explosions that come from improvised explosive devices. Sure, there are helicopter crashes, there are motor vehicle accidents, there are illnesses, there are other injuries, but the most um, severe range of injuries in the, in the biggest numbers come from this awful weapon, the improvised explosive device, which is a bomb which goes off underneath vehicles and blows people up. Now, the thing about Iraq and Afghanistan is that the survival rates have improved dramatically compared with previous wars. And I wanted to share with you the reasons why this might be. If you look at World War I, the ratio of deaths to wounded in that graph, 1 to 1.8 whereas Operation Iraqi Freedom, and it's similar in Afghanistan, it's gone to 1 to 7.4 ratio of deaths to wounded. So many more are surviving their wounds uh, and, and getting back home. The mortality from war wounds of those who make it to hospital, this is US figures, but it's very similar for our figures, have dropped from, say, 30% in World War II down to below 10% now in Afghanistan. And if you look at the best trauma systems we've got in Australia, and I take the Alfred Hospital, which is one of the leading ones where I work, the mortality from trauma is, is just under 10% of those who make it to hospital. Well, it's very similar in Afghanistan. And that's pretty amazing, considering the range of wounds are even more severe than what we see from blunt motor vehicle accidents, blunt trauma in motor vehicle accidents, but also the fact that uh, the volume of, uh, of trauma is, is, is great 
in Afghanistan. There are often mass casualties coming in, uh, yet the mortality has dropped to that low level. Well, we have to look at the military trauma system to try and work out why. The military trauma system is now highly developed. There's been a revolution in military trauma care, which has now really uh, influenced the way we practice trauma in the civilian sector as well. There's a lot of attention to prevention of trauma, uh, and I'll talk about armour protection in a minute. There's buddy care, where we teach all of our soldiers to uh, look after their mates, uh, particularly when it comes to first aid. We provide initial resuscitation, that's level one care, with medics and trained first aiders. Everyone is a trained first aider in defence. They're medevaced by road or amb ambulance to level two where they can get initial wound surgery. And that's often very close to the fighting edge of the battle. And then they get tactical aeromedical evacuation in helicopters to a more advanced surgical facility where there are more specialist surgeons available like neurosurgeons, fasciomax surgeons, etc. And then they get evacuated by fixed wing aircraft to a level four facility, which might be in Germany or back in the States or back, back in Australia, where the advanced care goes on and then the rehabilitation phase. So we have improved armour protection, so that's reduced the impact of some of these injuries. We have improved personal armour protection. We also train our medics very, uh, very um, to be expert first aiders and to be able to deliver uh, initial resuscitation in the field whilst under fire. Uh, this is obviously a very, very um, difficult thing for these guys to do, but they, they, they save many lives doing it. And uh, the reason they, one of the reasons they do it so well is that, that we train them to do it before they go. We have mission rehearsal exercises, so they're very well prepared mentally, physically, and training-wise to do this work. They're trained in dark, smoky, noisy environments, just like it would be in the real, the real environment. We also have mission rehearsal exercises for all of our health personnel so that we can rehearse uh, these trauma scenarios before the team actually uh, deploys as a team. So they all know each other, they've all worked together, and that produces a fantastic outcome when they're working as a team. We have now, instead of the golden hour, we have the platinum five which is the first five minutes after trauma, where, as I said, the medics have to, have to do their care under fire. They have to drag the casualties out of the line of fire and give them that initial resuscitation that will save their lives. And these days, what, what's killing our, our wounded soldiers is bleeding, less so airways. So we put C before the ABC in military military um, practice, so circulation and stopping bleeding becomes number one, and that saves lives. And one of the things that saved many lives is the tourniquet. Tourniquet is sort of an ancient instrument, but it's come back into favour in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and now is coming back into favour in the civilian sector, because these soldiers carry personal tourniquets on their, on their, in, in, in their, uh, their clothing, so they can rapidly apply these tourniquets if they have severe wounding from, from blast injuries. They can either put it on themselves or their, their medics and, and, and buddies can put it on for them. But that is what is saving lives, saving many lives. We have hemostatic bandages which have hemostatic agents in them like quick clot which stop major bleeding. We have intraosseous needles which can get very quick uh, intravenous access, and, we, and, and these medics are trained to drain tension pneumothoraces. And all of these things will save lives, but that's just in the first five minutes. Tourniquets, quick clot, aeromedical evacuation, dedicated AME, improved primary medic care, improved resuscitation, high quality triage once they get to the more advanced hospital, mass casualty management, damage control resuscitation, damage control surgery, forward surgical teams with earlier surgery and improved ICU care. Damage control surgery, abbreviated, very um, major surgery, but done very quickly just to stop bleeding, stop leaking from uh, ruptured organs uh, and um, 
clean up contamination, leaving abdomens open is, has saved many lives. Having CT scanners in these advanced military medical hospitals close to the front line, you need CT scanners to manage severe trauma. Having head and neck teams involved with neurosurgeons and maxillofacial surgeons, because there are many injury, complex injuries to the head and neck which are life-threatening, which general surgeons find it difficult to cope with. You need more specialist care for those things. Aggressive control of intracranial pressure, reduced holding times, rapid evacuation, and another major advance is the critical aeromedical transport teams, which we now have in our from the Royal Australian um, Air Force. Uh, having taken the idea from the Americans. And what this is, I'll show you later on, but it's maintaining intensive care continuously in flight for long flights when the, these injured soldiers are coming back from Afghanistan to Australia. There are no administrative blocks in these hospitals. It's a joy to work in them because when patients need care, they just go straight to the operating room or straight to the CT scanner. There's no thought about whether there are any beds available, whether there are theatres available. The patients just go where they have to go in very quick time. It's a very effective team with clear leadership and accountability and very effective training of personnel, both individually and in the teams, as I said. There's also a joint uh, theatre trauma registry, which is where all the data from all the patients is recorded. This is an enormous database, a repository of information from which you can do research, you can learn what works and what doesn't work, and that's exactly what the system has done. It's a very rapid feedback to, uh, to change the system if things can be done better. We learn what works, what doesn't work, and we implement what does work, and turf out what doesn't work, and that happens very rapidly. The system is very flexible and very open to change. And there's a lot of clinical and laboratory research going on during, these, during this uh, Iraq and Afghanistan campaign, which has led to improved outcomes. Flexibility is the key. Data collection, research, trialling of new treatments in the field, having a joint theatre registry which, which then produces guidelines. And many of these guidelines are freely available on the web. You can look them up. And they're now being implemented in civilian hospitals. The system is good on reflection, rapid reflection. It looks at itself and it, it continually improves and it publishes its results. There are many courses and credentialing that's required for the personnel who deploy as well. But I was proud to serve with the Americans and my other Australian colleagues in Iraq back in 2005. And uh, I would say that hospital in tents was uh, really the A-team. And has continued to be the A-team in uh, Iraq and, no, Iraq's finished, but now in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan hospitals are in fixed uh, buildings, structures, not in tents, but in, in Iraq we were in tents. The triage was done under this tent once the patients came off the helicopters. They were moved into the emergency room. I just want to take you very briefly through the patient journey in the military trauma system so you can see how efficiently it really does work. This is the emergency room and sometimes we'd get 20, 30 or more casualties coming in at once which have to be rapidly triaged and work out which patients need to go to the operating room, which patients go to CT, which patients are going to die and which patients can be left in the ward because they're not severely injured. The patient has x-rays in the emergency room, they get intubated if they're not already, blood transfusions are given, there's a blood bank in Iraq the soldiers were donating their blood, but in Afghanistan we use frozen blood stores. The intensive care units can do anything we can do in Australia, except for dialysis, because there was no real need for dialysis. But apart from that, we could do everything. You'll see it's a hostile environment. These environments are, are in a war zone, and, and this is a nurse who's attending an Iraqi patient. You'll see the gear that he's wearing because the hospital's under threat. Bombs are going off around the hospital. The operating theatres, there are two, uh, two, two uh, tables in the same room. There were, six, there were three rooms, six tables going non-stop 24 hours a day when I was there. It was very high intensity uh, work. The bomb blasts are very severe injuries, the most severe that I've ever seen, and certainly the ones in the 
I'm sure, uh, who have dealt with bomb blasts in this audience will, will agree with me because the thing about these injuries is that they're, they're tr a triad of, of trauma, including the blast effect, the blast wave effect, which damages the internal organs, the penetration of fragments from the bomb, and then the heat effects from the hot air blast, which cause burns. So that triad of trauma is, is much more than you get from a, from a motor vehicle accident. And that's a, that's a typical blast injury to the chest where you get bruising of the lungs, bleeding in the lungs, impaired ventilation, and that's just the lungs. The abdomen, uh, as I said, the abdomens are left open we write on the abdominal wall what was done so that the next surgeon, because these patients often have multiple operations, they go to the next hospital and have their next operation, and they're explored multiple times. Uh, amputations are very common. Limb injuries are very common. You need orthopaedic surgeons in this environment. Uh, very complex orthopaedic injuries with soft tissue wounding are very common. And uh, burns are very common. Uh, and this, this uh, soldier is going to lose the fingers on his left hand from that burn. The head and neck team was vital in this environment because head and neck blast injuries are very common and that's what it does to the brain. The brain becomes very engorged and swollen. There's a fragment that's penetrated the brain and uh, these patients are, 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 um, can, can have their lives saved by very urgent uh, expert neurosurgery. The facial skeleton can be, can be destroyed. But the patients, once they have all this expert high-level treatment, are then put onto a gurney with a monitoring gear in a canopy over the top of them. And uh, you'll see this soldier's got severe burns to his face from a blast injury. And then they're bundled up into a C-17 Globemaster aircraft. And we have these in our Air Force as well. And the idea with these is, as I said before, you have a, a flying intensive care unit. Inside that, you could drive a couple, of, a couple of trucks or more. But this has now been configured into a hospital, a flying hospital. And uh, this is our C-17 with our personnel doing a training exercise to look after our people on their way back from, from, uh, from the area of conflict. They're initially taken to Landstuhl Hospital, which is the American hospital in Germany and then they're flown back to Australia. So it takes a total of about 34 hours to fly from Kandahar to Ramstein in Germany and then back to Australia via Diego Garcia. That's a long time, but if you compare that with Vietnam, it was often 30 days or more before the injured, our injured soldiers were repatriated back to Australia from Vietnam. So the, the time frame for all of this treatment and evacuation has contracted enormously since Vietnam. So you've got these injured soldiers who are back in Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. or Bethesda uh, within three or four days of their injury and likewise getting back to Australia within three, four or five days of their injury. But to finish, this is what it's all about. Here is a soldier, an American soldier as it happens, but we've had, we've had at least 200 of our own people with serious injuries You'll see this, this poor chap has lost both his legs, he's got bilateral arm injuries, he's got external fixation on his left arm, he's had his abdomen opened, he's had his head opened, in fact I did it, he's, uh, he's got a blast injury to his chest so he's on a ventilator and you'll see every part of his body is injured from the tip of his top of his head to the tip of his toes. That's the thing about blast injury, it's polytrauma, it injures the whole body. It also injures the mind, and uh, Commodore Wallace is going to talk about, about the mental side of, of this as well. But just very briefly, I want to emphasise that it's not just what happens in Afghanistan, it's clearly what happens back home. And the ADF are particularly concerned about caring for injured soldiers, airmen, sailors. Uh, and uh, there are very uh, uh, well-developed programs for mental, physical, social rehabilitation, and Duncan Wallace is going to talk in more detail about these. The rehabilitation programs have, have expanded dramatically. Uh, I can say that Lieutenant General Lay, when he was Chief of Army, was particularly concerned about the welfare of injured soldiers, uh, and uh, that 
concern has carried on for, for, uh, with the, the chiefs of, of service that have come after him and the chiefs of the Defence Force. They've all been con incredibly concerned about looking after our injured veterans and making sure the correct policies have been in place to do that and the correct finances have come from, enough finance have come from government to do that. And so we can be very proud, I think, of, uh, of, the, of the care that we, we give our injured soldiers, sailors and airmen, both in, in the war zones, but once they come back to Australia. And even some of them have gone on to the Paralympics and done extremely well. And um, some of them have, uh, have, have gone back to, uh, to serving again in their original units. Just very briefly, I did write an article on blast injury to the brain because it was said to me yesterday that once you've got a blast injury to the brain, you're finished, you're wrecked. Why, why are we even treating some of these severe injuries? Well, it so happens that the, the outcome from blast injury to the brain, I'm talking about severe blast injury, is actually better than gunshot wound to the brain. If you get, if you get hit in the head uh, by, by a bullet, you, you're probably going to do worse than if you get, you get involved in a bomb blast. So it is worth treating these individuals because they can do very well. And uh, we shouldn't be too nihilistic about these wounds. We should do all we can to, uh, to help these injured soldiers because in the end we want them to survive, we want them to recover, we want them to get back to their families, we want them to get back to employability, hopefully in the ADF, if that's what they want. But we certainly want to support them if they're not able to get back into the ADF and if they are, if they are transitioning out of the Defence Force and becoming veterans and looked after by the Department of Veterans Affairs. So again, Duncan Wallace will, will follow that stream in more detail. But uh, in the end, that's what it's all about, getting our injured soldiers back to recovery through, uh, through, a, through expert care and uh, expert rehabilitation programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, General Rosenfeld. Our uh, next speaker is Commodore Duncan Wallace. And Commodore Wallace has extensive operational experience as a medical officer in the Navy Reserve. He was deployed on Op Reflex in 2001 to Christmas Island and Ashmore Reef and on active service in East Timor, Iraq, Afghanistan and the Persian Gulf. He has also deployed on humanitarian assistance ta tasks to Banda Ashe and Nias in, Indo in Indonesia. In 2006, he was awarded a group commendation uh, from the Chief of the Australian Defence Force for participation in the recovery of bodies of ADF personnel from the wreckage of helicopter Shark 02 in Nias in 2005. Commodore Wallace currently works as a psychiatrist at the Australian Defence Force Centre for Mental Health at HMAS Penguin in Sydney and, he, uh, and was posted to the position of Director uh, General Navy Health Reserves in May 2012. Please join me in welcoming Commodore Wallace. Thank you, Brian. General Lay, General Rosenfeld, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you to the AMA for inviting me to speak on mental health in the Australian Defence Force. Warwick Hoff asked me to address these questions in my presentation today. What's the prevalence of mental disorders in the ADF, uh, comparing those who've deployed to those who've not deployed? Which members of the ADF may be at particular risk of developing mental disorders? Uh, to compare the management of mental disorders to physical injuries? Uh, what are the barriers to, to mental health care? What are the strengths and weaknesses of ADF mental health services? And how well are ADF members supported in their transition to service life? And how can we improve this? By way of background, as already mentioned, since 1999, uh, Australian Defence Force personnel have deployed on peacekeeping, humanitarian assistance and active service operations in these locations. This isn't a full list, I can tell you this. So there's a multitude of places where we have served. Uh, over over 45,000 people have deployed uh, to conflict areas and on peacekeeping operations where uh, over 50% of the Permanent Defence Force have, have participated in these operations. And also over a third of reserve uh, service uh, personnel have deployed as well. And many of people have deployed on multiple occasions, as you can see there. 
Currently, we've got still 400 people deployed in Afghanistan, embedded in various headquarters, working as instructors and advisors. We've got 800 people still in the Middle East, in the United Arab Emirates, and 200 people in uh, the currently deployed warship on anti-piracy patrols. Uh, this has come at a cost. As mentioned, we've had 40 killed, over 260 wounded in action, which includes seven members who suffered traumatic limb amputation and at least 38 cases of mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, and this is where this was listed as the primary diagnosis. Casualties have also occurred in the other operations, four killed in Timor, Iraq, Bougainville, Solomon Islands, and nine in, uh, in Nias uh, with the helicopter crash that Brian mentioned earlier. So what about the prevalence of mental disorders? We have good data, which comes from this 2010 ADF Mental Health Wellbeing and Prevalence Study, which is uh, conducted by the Centre for Traumatic Stress uh, at Adelaide University, Sandy McFarland and Stephanie Hodson. Uh, that group uh, uh, presented questionnaires to almost 25,000, almost half the Australian Defence Force, uh, on, on, mental health, uh, on, on their mental health. This was followed up with 1,800 diagnostic interviews and, uh, and the data was crunched. From this, we learnt that anxiety disorders are the most common mental disorder in the ADF, with the higher prevalence amongst females, which is similar to, to the civilian population. And yes, PTSD is the most prevalent anxiety disorder uh, occurring most commonly amongst males. This figure compares, this figure shows 12-month prevalence of anxiety disorders broken down by disorder. The, the purple colour are the ADF rates and the red colour are age match civilian rates from Australian Bureau of Statistics. And for me the standout one there is uh, the PTSD uh, figure there. So uh, we, we, this data showed 8.3% 12-month prevalence of uh, PTSD in the ADF sample uh, compared to the civilian sample of around about 5%. Looking at affective disorders, uh, this showed us that uh, the ADF males actually experienced higher rates of mood disorders than the Australian civilian sample, and this was mostly accounted for by the experience of depressive disorders. Looking at the breakdown again, uh, the purple, the plum coloured uh, chart, the Defence Force figures, and the, for depressive episodes, about 6% for the ADF and about 3% for civilian population. By depressive episodes, they included mild, moderate and uh, severe major depressive disorders, and I think it also includes uh, adjustment disorders which are le le less severe and fairly common in a defence population. In terms of the effects of deployment, uh, the Milhop study did not find an increased prevalence of mental disorders in personnel who have deployed on operations compared to those who did not. So what it, what it determined was it wasn't the number of deployments but it was the type of experience on deployment. In particular, your exposure to trauma or combat. This was the main risk factor for development of PTSD and other disorders, in particular depression. So from this, we know that pe the people who are at particular risk are going to be infantry, armoured corps, combat engineers, combat medics, and special forces. Com they are the commandos and, uh, and SAS. In terms of barriers to care, why do people delay seeking treatment? Uh, this was uh, studied in the, in the Milhop study, and it, as you can see, the top, uh, the top answer was, it might stop me from being deployed, almost 37%. And yes, I must say, if you've got a, uh, a, uh, a depressive disorder, uh, we are going to stop you from deploying overseas. We want you to stay where you are and have treatment. Uh, see a psychiatrist and a psychologist and have medication. And yes, there may be occupational restrictions. You may not be able to drive an armoured vehicle or fly a plane or, or have access to weapons. So uh, uh, that, that's, that's important. Will, will it harm their career prospects? Or a quarter of people uh, said that it would. And yes, if you are suffering from a major mental disorder, it is certainly going to slow down your career progression. Now this quote from uh, General Cantwell is quite, uh, quite relevant. Those of you who don't know, General Cantwell uh, wrote his memoirs and he's described how he had symptoms of PTSD for 20 years without uh, actually seeking treatment until, until he uh, was at the end of his, his career. And what he said here was, over the last decade, the, the ADF has done a great deal to address mental health and promote greater awareness of the problem but much of the target audience isn't listening or can't bring themselves to admit that the message is aimed at them. So I agree with him that part of the problem, barriers to care, is about denial. 
But denial is complicated and uh, this uh, US national comorbidity study showed one of the elements of denial was people wanted to handle the problem on their own. They felt that they could look after themselves better than, than doctors or psychologists. And there's some unpublished work uh, by Amy Adler, the US Army uh, Mental Health uh, Research Group, which should be coming out soon, which has looked at some techniques that emphasise these self-care ideas, uh, highlight these, and, and which may be able to then improve the uptake of mental health services and, and get people into care. Uh, in terms of the, the flip side to the barriers of care is help seeking, and I think this is a, a good news story. The Millhop study showed about one in five personnel reported that they had actually sought help for a stress-related problem or emotional problem, mental health problem in the previous 12 months. Uh, half the sample who were, we considered to have PTSD or depressive episodes reported that they had received treatment. And this compares quite favourably to Australian and US civilian figures. And if you compare it to, to US military figures, it compares a lot better than, uh, th than what uh, US veterans and US serving members are reporting. So what's Defence doing? What care do they provide to uh, members and their families? Well, firstly, you can see your general practitioner. You can go and see a psychologist and rehabilitation counsellor. You've got full access to clinical psychologists and, and psychiatrists and accredited PTSD treatment programs like the very good programs at the Mater Hospital in Townsville, the Tawang Clinic in Brisbane. Uh, and also, uh, veterans and their families can, can access the Veterans and Vietnam Ve and Veterans Families Counselling Service, which uh, uh, enables access to a full range of services to the, to the veteran and their entire family. In terms of rehabilitation, the Joint Health Command, who provides health care and defence, is a Comcare approved workplace rehab provider. And in the last financial year, almost 4,500 ADF members met the criteria for referral and undertook a compre comprehensive rehab assessment. And of these rehab referrals, about 18% presented with a primary diagnosis of a mental health uh, problem, uh, depression being the most common diagnosis. From these rehab programs, the, the people who completed them in that last financial year, 40% of those with a mental health condition, where that was the primary diagnosis, were successfully able to return to work. For those with a physical health condition, it was over 70%, and uh, Defence describes an overall return to work rate of, of a bit over 70%. The Simpson Assistance Program is, is a number of projects uh, which uh, Defence has invested in to, uh, to provide uh, recovery services. And for me, the standout from this list are the, is the Intensive Recovery Team Pilot. This is, this is uh, still underway in Townsville and in Holsworthy, where we've got multidisciplinary rehab teams headed up by a rehab physician. Uh, with a rehabilitation specialists, occupational therapists, psychologists to provide coordinated uh, uh, case, uh, complex case management for ill and injured uh, members. More initiatives there. Uh, the standout is, is lots of training, mandatory training each year on suicide awareness, uh, resilience training. Uh, Defence has partnered with DVA for a number of smartphone apps, PDST, Coach and a number of uh, websites uh, which provide good information. More of that a bit later on. Uh, we participate and support the Paralympics and the ADF Theatre Project, which some of you may have seen that play, The Long Way Home, where a number of uh, injured uh, Australian veterans participated and this uh, was uh, put on around the country and assist in, in raising awareness of uh, the mental health consequences of combat service. Research is ongoing, Defence is, is uh, partnering uh, with DVA and uh, setting up an ongoing study of uh, mental health and wellbeing into transition. It's going to be a very large study. We're looking to track the 25,000 people that we saw before and track them into the future uh, in a great deal of detail. Uh, recently, CDF sponsored a very large community workshop here in Canberra, linking Defence with DVA and ex-service and veterans communities, looking to identify gaps in the services to veterans and trying to improve this continuum of, of care for people transitioning to civilian life or into uh, reserve service. For me, the standout here are the soldier recovery centres, which General Lay's had a lot to do. Uh, these are four uh, wonderful facilities in Darwin, Townsville, uh, Brisbane and Sydney, uh, purpose-built state-of-the-art uh, rehab centres with full rehabilitation, occupational therapy and physiotherapy equipment with, uh, with gymna gymnasiums as well. 
in terms of what DVA is doing under their 2020 plan. They've set up uh, 37 on-base uh, services, advisory services, so people don't even have to leave the base. They, don't have to, they can go and, and start uh, the process of uh, seeking a claim from DVA, connecting with DVA as they consider uh, transitioning out of the service. Uh, as mentioned, DVA with Defence has, mentioned, has, has uh, developed a number of online programs, these are very effective smartphone apps, PDSD Australia Coach and At Ease. And DVA is, is uh, actively working to improve links with uh, ex-service organisations like Mate for Mates, Soldier On and other, other activities like Veterans Health Week uh, to promote awareness. And finally there's uh, implementation coming soon, uh, it's, this has been in the pipeline for a long time, of a Medicare based uh, ADF uh, post-discharge GP, GP health assessment for veterans who are not yet linked to Veterans Affairs. So I think that's going to be uh, uh, a very important initiative. So in conclusion, we know that many ADF members have been exposed to combat and potentially traumatic events during these recent years on, on operations. And unfortunately, a significant number will develop mental disorders. However, ADF and uh, Vet Veterans Affairs are working to provide high quality care to serving members and those who are going to transition to civilian life. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Commodore Wallace. Our last speaker is Lieutenant General, General Peter Leahy. Uh, General Leahy has had a 37-year career as a soldier, which included serving as the Chief of Army between 2002 and 2008. Since leaving the Army, he has joined the University of Canberra as a, as a, uh, as a Professor and Foundation Director of the National Security Institute. He has become involved with many organisations and committees relating to serving and ex-serving defence personnel, including being Chair of Soldier On an organisation dedicated to supporting Australia's wounded, serving and ex-serving. His particular passion is raising awareness around reducing the stigma attached to post-traumatic stress. Please join me in welcoming General Leahy. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you and particularly to share the podium with uh, Jeff and Duncan, and Jeff in particular, Jeff's contribution to the Australian Defence Force, but particularly to the Australian Army, is something I'd really wish to acknowledge uh, publicly. Uh, a great bloke, uh, a great surgeon, and a great Australian. And I also note in the audience Susan Newhouse, uh, and Susan, I'm going to say something about your motion, which I'll wholeheartedly support as being a great initiative. Uh, I was asked to talk about Soldier On, uh, and I'll do that gladly. But I also just note that uh, in terms of some of the changes in what's happened in the nature of conflict, if you haven't seen a book called The Utility of Force by a British general, and you'll get to know that he's a British general because his name is Rupert Smith, you should have a read of that because it talks about the changing nature of conflict. And what Rupert suggests, and he was very much involved in Bosnia and Herzegovina and those sorts of areas, the utility of force has changed. And in a dramatic way, he opens his book and the first sentence says, war exists no more. So those big industrial scale wars that we're used to in the last century, First World War, Second World War, even Korea. And we saw it change though, uh, through Vietnam and then Rwanda and Cambodia and Somalia and that long list that the Australian military forces had been involved in. And please forgive me if I slip and just say army, I, I can't help myself, but we've all been involved in Navy and Air Force and other agencies of government. But some of the things that stand out are that it's a war among the population. It's no longer just soldiers going off to war and being injured. Populations are being injured now. Uh, we're seeing our soldiers involved much more in small groups it's not battalions being wielded around the battlefield. It's guys inside souks uh, in Iraq, and Afghanistan. It's being inside villages and small groups. And so much more responsibility is devolved down. We're seeing a lot more humanitarian and disaster relief operations. And we're going to see many more of those sorts of things. Uh, Jeff is very right when he identifies IEDs as perhaps the biggest problem we've got at the moment. And I think... Uh, traumatic 
brain injury is, is a great issue. So war has changed, and I think we need to recognise that. And clearly, as Jeff so well explained, the nature of the support that we're giving our soldiers has changed. And I would thank uh, all of the medical profession, because uh, Jeff showed those pictures of the hospital. It was Taji, I think, was it, Jeff? Just north of uh, Baghdad. Um, I visited there and heard of the great work of Jeff. And, um, it's fantastic that our soldiers are coming home alive, but they're coming home alive much more injured than we've seen before, and we have to do something about that. And that's where charities and government organisations such as Mates for Mates, such as Legacy, such as RSLs in the various states, in particular the RSL Life Care, have become involved to look after our soldiers, sailors and airmen, who have come home. In my own case, this is the purpose of Soldier On. It's a charity that's been going for two years now, and it's not just about soldiers, sailors and airmen. We recognise that this changing nature of war has brought about what many people call a whole-of-government response, or indeed a whole-of-nation response. And so as we developed over these last two years, the focus was on the military, but we've also seen deployed, particularly in Afghanistan, the Australian Federal Police. Many of our intelligence agencies have deployed forward. Non-governmental organisations, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and others. We're conscious that journalists have become involved in these sorts of issues and wonder how we can help them. And clearly the medical profession. So we see the need to support all of the whole of nation effort that's deployed forward, not just our soldiers, sailors and airmen. Uh, Duncan showed you the figure of 261 who have been physically injured. Uh, we also talked about those who have been psychologically injured. We're not sure about those figures, but what we do know is that they're all going to need support. Um, many will not declare. Some will be late onset. There is certainly a stigma around declaring some form of mental illness. Uh, and those who are making a transition from military to civil life can tend to be pretty slow about getting involved in the Department of Veterans Affairs. So we're just not sure about the numbers. On the issue of stigma, uh, we've done some work uh, with overseas organisations, and I know I'm probably venturing into um, maybe a minefield here, we're not happy with the term post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it's got a pejorative sense about it. I know it has particular clinical reasons. Uh, we're rather more interested in perhaps post-traumatic stress or looking at some of the work that's coming out of Canada and the United States, what they call OSI, or Operational Stress Injury, which pulls all of these things together. Uh, it's a desire to try and just diminish that level of stigma. Where did Soldier On come from? Um, Mr John Bale, who's now a reserve officer, he had a career in the Australian Army. This is his mate uh, Michael Fussell, who died in Afghanistan in 2008 from an IED attack. Uh, and John went to school with him and thought, what if Mike came home injured? What would I do? Um, he and his friend, that is uh, John's friend, Cavan Wilson, who was a Royal Australian Air Force officer who had been involved in the aeromedical evacuation of many of our people from Iraq and Afghanistan, decided that they were going to form a charity. Somehow I got caught up with it. And I must admit I'm thrilled to be involved in what I think is a great national effort, a great purpose to make sure that we honour our soldiers who have been wounded in service of this nation. Uh, charity has three pillars. To inspire our people to get on with the rest of their lives. At the same time, inspire the Australian public to acknowledge physically, financially and emotionally what our soldiers have gone through. And so you're going to see things like Seamus and Heath, who just walked with Prince Harry to the South Pole. We've got people who are going to retrace the steps of the Tour de France very shortly, people playing golf after the Open in St Andrews. 
a range of activities where we hope to get public recognition and allow people to understand that even though guys like Seamus and Heath were both physically wounded, one of them with quite severe spinal injuries, that they can still do amazing things. And it helps them also understand that life doesn't stop when you're injured. And Seamus and Heath uh, have just run the London Marathon. So walk to the South Pole and then go off and do the London Marathon. And before, they probably thought, oh, bug it, not much I can do now. Well, to them, they know that they can do a lot more. And that's the image we want to get out. We want to enhance the support that our soldiers get. And as you've just heard from Duncan, and as I hope you're seeing, we're finding we don't have to do much work here. The national effort from the ADF, and I'm very proud of what the ADF has done, very proud of what DVA is doing and what the general community is doing, we're actually finding that as one of our pillars, this is probably the thinnest one. We don't have to do so much work into there. The final pillar is to empower. And essentially this is empower our injured to get on with the rest of their lives. People who join the military want a sense of purpose. If you look at the army advertising, it's challenge yourself. We don't want them sit around thinking, well, not much that I can do. We do want to challenge them. We do want them to understand that they can continue contributing to their family and to the community because that's a lot of who they are. And so we're looking at training programs and we're very grateful that organisations such as um, Frontier here in Canberra are offering free training, business training. We've got 50 people undergoing training, a one-year diploma course to prepare them for work after the military. And there's a whole range of things happening there. So these are the sorts of things to prepare people for the rest of their lives because, frankly, our aim would be to make sure that as few as possible of these guys become TPI. We want them to make a contribution to society. Well, why do soldiers go off and do this? Well, I talked about challenge. It is a challenge. I've been really proud of our soldiers, sailors and airmen. They've gone to the most difficult environments and the fact that we've awarded Victoria Crosses medals of gallantry to so many of our soldiers shows that this is a bad place to be. It's a frightening place to be. But they've shown bravery and courage and valour because that's what they want to do. They're part of a team. We talk about sporting teams. Well, uh, I wore the uniform of Australia. Cricketers wear it as well. But I think the fact that our soldiers wear our uniform for so long in such adverse conditions, it's something they can be really proud of and we should be proud of them. Uh, they also have this understanding and many of them talk about their fathers and their grandfathers. I spent yesterday morning up at the War Memorial with the Cowboys and let's hope the Cowboys beat the uh, Raiders here today. But they talked about the team and the expectation. It's important that we acknowledge that these people are special and I think it's important that we help them afterwards. Jeff covered exceptionally well the care that comes out of the ADF. Uh, the rehabilitation is very important, as is the mental health support. But then we have to get this transition right. The transition from the ADF to the Departments of Veterans Affairs. Now, I'm seeing the uh, Minister for Veterans Affairs tomorrow to try and help with that link. But there are some real issues. In some segments of the ADF, the DVA, I think rather unfairly, doesn't have particularly good press. We've got to make sure that the transition is as easy as possible, it's as comprehensive as possible, and it actually adds real value to the support given to the people. I've talked about the TPAs, and really, TPIs rather, and really, I think the, your invitation to soldier on representing the other charities involved in this space is a great part of this GP education. Uh, we've talked about what happens inside the ADF. Uh, one of the things when the soldiers first started getting injured in Iraq and a bloke by the name of Michael Lydiard was one of the first guys who, who got really knocked about. Um, 
I started getting word, and I was Chief of Army then, I started getting word that when they wake up, the first question they ask is, do I still have a job? Now, I would have thought around minefields, you'd be asking another question, do I still have something else? But uh, they would ask this question, do I still have a job? So we set about making sure that when they woke up, whether it was in uh, Baghdad or in Kandahar or perhaps over, even over in uh, Lamstool, that there was someone there able to answer the question and say, the chief says you've still got a job. It's that sense of purpose, it's that sense of teamwork. And I think that's been honoured and I'm proud that it's been honoured because the Army, Navy and Air Force are keeping our people, they still do have a job. But for some, there will have to be a transition. And part of my sentiment involved in this is that I grew up just after, in the Army, I grew up just after the Vietnam era. And I can remember going down to the Q store and there'd be the guys who were injured in Vietnam and they'd be Hoppy or Wingy or someone like that. We'd found a job for them and we were looking after them. I think it's going well. There are still some gaps. In fact, I think my problem is that in some ways we're perhaps hanging on to those who are physically wounded too long and perhaps getting rid of those who are psychologically wounded too early. But the ADF is doing a great job. Transition, of course, is hard. Um, the Army becomes very much part of your life. It becomes another family. It's something that is hard to leave, particularly when you don't have a choice involved in it. So we've got to help people and make sure that they have this sense that there is something outside. There's something that I can have a sense of purpose towards once they leave the military. Stigma. Soldiers are trying to hide their injuries and I've certainly seen them deployed on the battlefield uh, where they will hide injuries because they don't want to let their mates down. They don't want to leave the team. They don't want to leave what they consider to be really important tasks and the ability to make a contribution to the people that they've seen overseas. It's the classic helping little girls go to school. This becomes a passion. Uh, but we have to recognise that you must not make a problem in terms of the contribution to the team and the safety of the rest of the team. The same applies for those who are continuing in service now. What can be done better? I think we need to understand as a community that we have a group of soldiers out there who have made a very significant personal contribution to the nation. We've talked about, as a charity, engaging the Australian population physically. That is, go and say, thanks, mate. If you travel around America, you'll see people come up and say, thank you for your service. It's just overwhelming in many places. It doesn't tend to happen here. So thanks for what you've done for the nation. Emotionally, support them in a whole range of activities and financially. Now, I'm not asking for money, but we do need support through legacy, through a whole range of activities because there are many people who need to be supported. Transition to civilian work is the key. A lot of soldiers have only ever known the military. So support that we get from people like Miles Jakeman is really appreciated. That's my pitch about Soldier On, my pitch about looking after our soldiers. And can I just say that uh, in terms of the draft resolution that I've seen, and I know Susan Newhouse has uh, moved the resolution, uh, if I was a voting member, I'd vote for this. Uh, I think what it does is give us a sense that uh, you want to help. There are more things that can be done, and I would certainly endorse the draft revolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, General Leahy. Uh, delegates on the screen uh, in a moment should be the draft motion, which I'd encourage you to read and consider um, during the Q&A session. And there's a hard copy that should be uh, circulated on the table as well. So uh, we have uh, quite a number of questions that have uh, come in, which is uh, fantastic. Um, I'll start with the first one. While travelling in the US recently, I was struck by how much more 
or where Americans are of their serving military and veterans. Simple but symbolic things like priority boarding at the airport for serving officers and veterans, discounted missions to museums, etc. I'm sure Australians are just as proud of our personnel. Are there ways we could enhance our public awareness of the support needed for our veterans particularly? Um, I'm I might mention that um, I've observed the same thing. I think the Americans are more patriotic, more demonstrative about the sorts of things that they do. Um, I wouldn't like to see us become that demonstrative, but I think there are more things that we can do. Um, we're certainly engaged with a number of um, commercial organisations to help train people, but perhaps discounts here and there and so on. Uh, there's a lot of that that does happen. It happens fairly quietly. If you come from some of the garrison towns, and I'd call Townsville a garrison town, for example, was the mob from uh, Queensland. Um, they get great support up there, uh, much the same around Brisbane. But I don't think it's in the Australian nature to, to really sort of say, hey, you know, look after me because of this. Uh, I'd rather see it come the other way, from, from the public and from the community. Uh, just quietly say, thank you for your service. Okay, uh, next question. Um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So how are the ADF and reserve personnel prepared during their training for the possibility of developing a mental health disorder such as anxiety and PTSD that may occur during their uh, time of service? Does screening of at-risk individuals occur at their time of enlistment? Uh, maybe Commander Wallace. Yes, well, certainly screening does occur at the time of enlistment. Uh, people have uh, uh, an interview by a psychologist and they go through their past psychiatric history, if there is any. Uh, in terms of resilience training, every member who joins the Army, Navy and Air Force uh, in recruit school and at various points during the course of their career undergo resilience training, which consists of basic cognitive behaviour therapy techniques. Uh, and that's been going on for a number of years now. The, the jury's out on the effectiveness, it's, it is being studied. In terms of uh, screening, uh, screening during the course of service, uh, I think we're about the only military in the world that does compulsory screening for everybody coming back from operational deployment. Everybody has to have a screen as they leave the theatre of, the, of operations or within seven days of returning home. And then, uh, depending on how they're faring, everybody has to have a follow-up screen within three to six months. So uh, a great deal of emphasis and, and, and work goes into this. Can I just add a little bit to that uh, in particular in relation to the screening? It's called RTAPs and POPs, Return to Australia Psychological Screening and Post-Operational Psychological Screening. Uh, I think it's wonderful, it's very effective. Uh, it gets people thinking along those lines. And the other thing is that we've tried to arrange is people come out of theatre, they go through some form of decompression. So rather than sort of hop on a plane as we saw in Vietnam, come back and get dumped at uh, some terminal in uh, Sydney or Melbourne. The guys come back as a team. We've had a number of welcome home parades. Uh, but that decompression, uh, normally in theatre uh, in the Middle East, uh, is really important. They sit around and talk about these sorts of things uh, and try and just come down a little bit. So the next question is, uh, there has been quite a lot of controversy regarding the prevalence of suicide in Vietnam veterans and their families. What is the current understanding of the relative risk of suicide in Australian servicemen returning from Afghanistan and Iraq? Uh, yes, that, that is a problem with, with uh, Vietnam veterans. We're aware that uh, risk of children of Vietnam veterans is two to three times higher than age-matched uh, uh, peers. Uh, fortunately, the Australian Defence Force, our suicide uh, is not too big a problem. Our figures are around about 0.6 of uh, the Australian community. Uh, the United States has a really very serious suicide problem with, within their military. Uh, it's something that's very uh, mon monitored very closely and it's obviously a very sensitive issue within the Defence Force. Okay. Um there has been severe criticism of the uh, US uh, uh, treatment of US veterans in their hospitals and financial support afterwards. Uh, is that uh, criticism justified and how do we compare? The, yes, they're, they're, they've had a lot of problems and if anybody's read uh, uh, Robert Gates, the last Secretary of Defence's memoirs, he said his frustrations with Veterans Affairs were one of the biggest problems that he had as, as a Secretary of Defence. Uh, early on in the conflict, uh, 
Uh, he, he sacked their, uh, 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 their, their Surgeon General, uh, the problems that they were having. He sacked the uh, uh, people in, in charge of uh, Veterans Affairs. They, they had a lot of problems and they're still having problems now. In the middle of last year they had over 600,000 claims for uh, members of the US Armed Forces uh, to, to uh, access Veterans Affairs treatment. They're struggling to cope with the volume. It's, it's a very hot political issue. Uh, and uh, in the Washington Post just the other day, there's calls for the scalp of uh, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, uh, Eric Shinseki, who's, a, who's, a, who's an excellent uh, uh, officer. He's a, a Vietnam veteran and, and disabled veteran himself. So it's an extremely uh, hot potato in the, in the United States and uh, we, we're certainly very aware of it and we, uh, we don't want it to get uh, to that, those sort of proportions out here. And I'm not seeing the issue as strong here. Um, I certainly see the same things. Eric Shinseki was an ex-Chief of Staff of the US Army and the Surgeon General that was sacked by Robert Gates was a Major General, the brother of a Chief of Staff of the US Army at the time. So they've really gone at it hard, but I think if you've seen some of their uh, veterans uh, hospitals, they needed to have a resurgence and a change. I'm not seeing the same issues here. I mentioned during my talk that there are some concerns by some of our veterans with the support they're getting by uh, DVA, but it's nowhere on that scale. Okay. Um, the uh, experiences that have been gained overseas in conflicts have all, always brought uh, improvements in medical care um, back to civilian practice. Um, we're very interested in uh, uh, doctors' health and well-being. So are there lessons, do you think, from uh, the conflict that we can learn in terms of doctors' health and well-being here? I, I think so, yes. Um, I think certainly in, in the surveillance and screening, uh, we know that uh, doctors see a great deal, as, as with uh, General Rosenfeld's talk. Uh, we, we do have to care for our colleagues and, and realise that, uh, that we are vulnerable too. Uh, we have to monitor them, we have to encourage them to get a GP. Lots of uh, doctors don't have GPs and we have to encourage them to look after themselves. So I th certainly think there are lessons to be learnt there, yes. Uh, so there are some uh, different definitions of PTSD that are currently uh, in use and um, what's the current uh, ADF's position on that? Well, we uh, predominantly use uh, the DSM. DSM-5 has come out. I know that's been uh, f pretty controversial. I think the DS DSM-5 has lowered the bar in terms of uh, what uh, the, the traumatic stress it people have been exposed to. I think it's uh, significantly changed from DSM-3, which came out in 1980. DSM-3, PTSD, is, was based on research from Vietnam veterans and Holocaust survivors. We were, General Lay and I were talking about this earlier. So that set the bar high in terms of what, uh, what the traumatic exposure is. I think DSM-5 has, uh, has, has lowered the bar. It has, incre it has included in the criteria uh, things uh, where people who have got indirect exposure, for example in uh, unmanned aerial vehicle operators and bomb damage assessors, people who are looking at imagery, which can be very confronting. So it now includes that in the diagnostic criteria. Uh, but there have been lots of problems with the DSM altogether. Uh, the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States, their peak uh, uh, research body, won't even use it. And uh, the, the director there, uh, Thomas Insel, has spoken out uh, quite strongly against it. A lot of us are still using DSM-4 uh, definition, which is, uh, 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 which, which is fairly useful. But uh, the DSM is a, is a classification tool. It's not a, not a textbook. Uh, we can use whichever, whichever one we want. A, a comment on the, on the post-traumatic stress injury, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm not sure if that will we'll make a difference. I think the, the main stigma arises from, from people having a mental condition. It could be uh, shell shock or it could be uh, combat fatigue uh, or post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it's that, that particular thing in confronting in yourself that there's something wrong with you mentally that you can't control. That's, that's the hard part for people to overcome and, and to go and seek help, and no matter what the name of the condition is. Thank you. Uh, this one's a two-part question. I think you're getting a workout, Commodore Wallace. Here. <laughs> so could you specifically comment on the incidence of drug and alcohol misuse amongst um, service members, uh, especially to identify uh, whether there has been... Sorry. 
uh, sorry, whether there has been any differences between members who have been deployed to conflict areas and members who have not been deployed. And second part is, can you comment on the evolution of the past defence policy of zero tolerance to the use of illicit drugs? Right. The uh, alcohol rates, I can't quote them off the top of my head. That Milhop study is available on the net. I think the, what, it, what it found was that uh, alcohol abuse rates were, were slightly elevated compared to the civilian population. I can't tell you what the effect was deployment, or those who deploy or hadn't deployed. Uh, yes, there's still pretty much a zero tolerance uh, response to uh, illicit drugs. Defence randomly does breath testing for alcohol on workplaces and also does random drug testing as well. Uh, so uh, we, we still take a, a very uh, strict uh, approach to, uh, to illicit drugs. Let me just make a comment on zero tolerance. Uh, I was around at the time when we introduced it. Um, I'll just give you the scenario that you're on the battlefield with somebody. He's got a pocket full of grenades. He's got a machine gun, or perhaps he's driving the armoured vehicle that you're in across terrain uh, using night vision goggles. I don't want people on drugs. I want them at the top of their game. Okay. Uh, as an ex-serving uh, officer, I am very disposed towards the continuing care of veterans. How is the transition from the ADF to DVA managed and how can it be improved? Is the ADF concerned about the bureaucracy involved with DVA and is the level of support offered adequate? It, it, it can be difficult making the transition. The paperwork uh, can, be, can be complicated. Uh, as in my talk, uh, DVA has set up 37 on-base services. They're really trying to make it as easy as possible uh, for people to, to make that transition. Um, there's a number of programs. Uh, uh, obviously, it could be better. I think the uh, defence, the, the ADF uh, GP check, I think that's a really good uh, initiative. I hope that that starts soon. As I mentioned, that's been a long time uh, in development. And what that means is that somebody who hasn't yet been fully linked with Veterans Affairs can go along and have a, a targeted uh, comprehensive health assessment and from there determine whether they've got any clinical conditions and then start the ball rolling with, uh, with Veterans Affairs. So that, that formal uh, linking with, with Veterans Affairs can be quite complicated. Having said that, uh, making contact with the Vietnam's Veterans Family Counselling Service, that can be a lot easier. Uh, and, uh, and also they their family members can ha have access there. So if you're a veteran, uh, you, whilst uh, you're, you're still a serving member, you can go along to the VVCS and, and, have, uh, and have full care uh, through their services. So that's, that's, they're very approachable. Okay. Um, next one is, why is there a breakdown between ADF needs and the delivery of services by Medibank Health Solutions? What is the ADF doing to audit and improve services to personnel and medical providers? What this uh, pertains to is uh, Defence changed the way they uh, deliver services and they've, they've done it on a contracted basis to Medibank Health Solutions. Uh, it, there was uh, some difficulties in the changeover. It's now being bedded down. Uh, I, I think it, it, it's improving the Medibank Health Solutions. They're going, uh, they're working very hard to to make sure people get specialist consul, specialist uh, appointments uh, when when they need to with with good uh, with, with with the shortest possible waiting times. So, what was the second part of, of that question, Brian? Uh, sorry, I just have to. Uh, it was about uh, audit. Um, so, what is the ADF doing to audit and improve services to personnel and medical providers? So using Medibank Health Solutions, one of the main benefits from that is that they've got a, a lot of stats that come out of this. They're constantly monitoring the waiting times, uh, the, uh, the performance of the doctors, whether the doctors are getting their reports back on time in appropriate uh, periods of time, uh, whether the doctors are getting paid. We know there's been problems with uh, some delays there. But uh, one of the beauties of this Medibank Health Solution is that they've got uh, firm data to, to constantly uh, audit how the healthcare is being delivered and whether that's being done efficiently. So that is an improvement. Okay, that might uh, be the last question. So while excellent uh, communication arrangements are in place for spouses, partners, while ADF members are in active service, they are isolated from assistance and care and refrain from, from seeking uh, help for fear of damaging the promotion opportunities of their partners. I ask that more assistance be given to partners and action be taken to ensure that the fear of damaging promotion opportunities is reduced. Unhappy partners and relationships contribute greatly to poor performance and illness. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, 
Well, I, I'd certainly agree with that, but people in the Defence Force are reluctant to bring their partners in. As a routine, when I do a psychiatric history, uh, always ask to see a person's partner. You know, and they say, what, you want, you want me to bring it to work? Uh, and then you make contact by, the, <clears throat> by telephone. Uh, that, that's often the best you can. It's, 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 people in Defence are reluctant to bring their partners in. Uh, they're concerned about what they might say about the, the severity of their problems. So that's, that's a real, real difficulty. And I, don't, I don't know how to overcome that. We, General Lay was talking about the POPs programs where we post-operational psychology screening for two of the task forces from Afghanistan. We had what we call POPs friendly programs. We had extra social workers from Department of, uh, for, from Defence Community Organisation. We had uh, childcare arrangements so people could bring their spouses along who could, to participate in those follow-up studies. And there was really small intake, uh, more, really small uptake of those services. So uh, uh, short of having full dependent care like they have in the US military and, and the UK military where the defence doctor looks after the, the member and their wife and their children, which have cost billions of dollars, short of doing that, I, I don't know what else to do. It's a constant battle to encourage uh, uh, family, family engagement in, in, in mental health uh, care. Can I add to that? Um, I've, I've had the same experiences uh, uh, briefly. I'm was deploying 300 soldiers from a battalion to Papua New Guinea to assist with the expansion of the PNGDF and I offered that the, I'd have a family briefing. Well, I got really knocked over by the diggers saying, don't do that. And uh, mostly because they didn't want their wives to know what allowances they were getting and how much extra pay and so on. I even had one soldier who'd convinced his wife that when he deployed on training and uh, educational uh, programs, uh, he actually had to take money from the family budget with him. Uh, we provided them all the money they needed and they get allowances, but this guy had turned it around and his wife was funding his piss-ups down in Pakapunyal or somewhere like that. Uh, the other angle to that, of course, is that the families are very much a part of what happens after they leave service. And what we're finding through the charity is that we must involve the family, must involve the spouse, because quite often they're out there, they can't understand what's happened to their spouse. This guy is uh, injured. Some of them are just sitting at home, sitting on the couch, on the bottle, watching television or playing games. They've withdrawn. Uh, they've got problems mixing with their family, mixing with society. And we're seeing a really great impact by involving the family uh, and allowing them to understand that it's about the whole person. It's about the whole relationship. And so we're running things, for example, here um, with Outward Bound. It's a family occasion. Um, we've run some Learn to Surf classes uh, where the families have come along. And one interesting part of that was that there were two couples on that. Uh, both of the blokes had been involved in a really nasty incident in Afghanistan. Uh, one had been the medic. Uh, he and his wife had shared all those experiences and uh, they were coping pretty well. Uh, the other bloke had not shared any of the experiences with the, his wife. The two wives got to talking and it's the first time she had any idea what her husband had been involved in. He just never told her. And so we think it's really important that we involve the whole of family as much as we can. Well, thank you. Thank you for our, to our three speakers for answering those questions and thank you for your presentations. We'll go to the motion. Uh, it's moved by Dr Susan Newhouse and seconded by Martin Nothling. Uh, so I invite uh, Susan to, uh, to speak to the motion. We just have the microphone in the middle of the floor on, please. Try again. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak in support of this motion. As we've heard very clearly this morning, our veteran community, particularly our contemporary veterans and their families, have got some very unique and complex healthcare needs. There's no doubt that over the last few years, particularly over the last 12 months, there have been some major and very laudable efforts by both Defence and DVA to close some of the gaps in their services. But we do know that on the other side of the fence, particularly for those who've transitioned out over the last decade, that there remain very significant barriers to care. 
not just in terms of the complexity of the healthcare needs, not just in terms of the increasing number of providers in this space, but also in terms of the stigma which we've heard about today. The additional one underlying all of this, though, is a system that is still perhaps more responsive to entitlement rather than to need. And as a consequence, there are some very real subpopulations which remain at risk of not accessing, for whatever reason, timely and appropriate care. As the peak medical body in this country, it is imperative that the AMA understands this complex space. We need to recognise that as our military draws down from operations in the Middle East, operations that have been longer in years than World War I and World War II combined, we stand at a unique time point. Everyone who goes to war accepts that there are risks. Risks of visible injury and risks of mental injury, which often doesn't present for many, many years. But we have an opportunity now, an opportunity to not repeat the mistakes of the past and to not repeat the burden of disease that has emerged in the decades following every other conflict that we as a nation have been involved. This is a rare opportunity in healthcare and it is imperative that the AMA has a clear policy framework in order to ensure that all those who've served their nation get comprehensive, accessible and timely care, both now and into the future. I commend this motion. Thank you, Dr Newhouse. Uh, Dr Nothling, would you like to speak? Okay. Uh, invite other speakers uh, for or against the motion to come to the microphone. Hello, Patricia Montanaro from South Australia, President in uh, AMA in South Australia. I'd like to support this well-considered motion. I believe the time has come to understand the health issues and implications of um, those who've been deployed and veterans. When doctors are not even aware who is ADF and who is a veteran, how can we ensure the appropriate considerations and treatment? I challenge you to consider, for example, what your history taking is of a woman who has one child and wants more, presenting to you with lethargy and struggling with life. And do you ask this woman if she has been deployed into an active service? And you ask her if there's been a covert operation and what she may have been exposed to. So I'd like to support and commend this motion. Thank you. Uh, Mukesh Haikal, I'm a GP from Melbourne. Uh, I'm not a voting member, but I just want to make a couple of points about this. Um, I think it's a very important part of the work that we do as doctors here in Australia and to work with our defence forces is a very important part of what we do. Um, some years ago, I attended with uh, our friend uh, Warwick uh, uh, meetings with the minister where the contracts that we used to have to sign were basically the contracts for having a submarine and the crossed out submarine and put doctors different services. So the way in which the uh, contracts to engage medical people in this process has to be sensible uh, and something that's sustainable in the way in which we, we do our work. The other thing is um, there's an awful lot of form filling that you have to do if you're doing DVA, and you've got to buy, buy pen and paper, um, and it's really arduous. If there was some common sense way of using today's technology that most of us have, in, in certainly in primary care and more so, that can be actually streamlined. And it's a really simple thing to do, but as we know, it's always not done very sensibly when it's actually put into an active place. But by working with the profession, the way in which these forms can actually be made more, uh, more useful, easy to work through, it can be done very well. The motions I like very much, but I must say we don't need another, unique, another identifier. Every Australian has one unique identifier. Just that no buggers using it, but it's there. Once that's it's linked to whatever your status is, you're away, you don't need another number, it's there already. 20, 2010 it came in. Um, so th these are things that we can all do and make a big difference straight away without doing an awful lot more. But I certainly like the sentiment of the motions and I would support them too. Thank you. I'm Wayne Hurdy from Queensland. All my friends here know me as Dr Wayne Hurdy, but a few of them might also know that I'm Lieutenant Colonel Wayne Hurdy, so I see this from more than one perspective. About two weeks ago, uh, not very far from where I practice, one of my colleagues held a meeting of vets uh, to discuss their DVA entitlements. About 40 vets turned up and it became very emotive, very violent, and security were called, and I would indicate uh, to the audience that this is a very, very important issue and please don't let this one go past you.
Okay, I'll invite uh, Dr. Nothing to speak. You happy? Okay. Dr. Newhouse, would you like to speak? No. Okay, then I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Thank you. Against? Any abstentions? I'll declare it carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, uh, that concludes the session. Thank you, Brian, for a very informative and relevant session. Uh, we break now for morning tea and we'll reconvene at 11 for the election of office bearers, which will be both exciting and formal. Um, during the break, please sign in at the back and you'll receive a blue voting version of a delegate card. You need your blue card to vote in the elections. It'll also be a closed session, so that is... Uh, delegates and uh, state and federal AMA staff and the international observers. We'll see you at 11. Thank you. <laughs>